My name is Frances O'Hearn. I was born July 13, 1930 at St. Mary of Nazareth Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. My mother was immediately moved to a sanitarium and for seven years I lived with my aunt and uncle and thought that they were my mother and father. Tell me more about that. I lived with them in Barrington. They were both alcoholics, so I kind of grew up on pretzels at various bars in, the, in, the, in, in town. And, um, but then I developed whooping cough when I was seven, and I think my aunt thought that I was going to die in, in her doorstep, so she made my mother and father take me back. My sister, who's two years older than I am, was already living with them. She, they took her first after they were released from the sanitarium. They were in the sanit. My father came from Ireland, and he was. Uh, he probably went to the sanitarium shortly after he was here. I think he had. They called it something else in that, that those days, but I mean, it, it was it was tuberculosis, and so they were in the in the in the sanitarium in Chicago on, on Peterson Avenue, and. Um, and then my mother contracted it, so she went shortly after I was born. She was running something like 104 fever, and, and she had a out of heaven, out of life experience. She actually saw heaven and everything because, of course, she was at a Catholic hospital. She also told them to turn that damn crucifix around <laughs> when they came in her rooms. But they, they lived there for years, but the women and men had separate, uh, separate accommodations there. So they, you know, and there's, the, there's a story about my father sitting with a buddy of his on a bench and saying, um, boy, that woman has really good looking legs. And, and his friend said to him, that's your wife. <laughs> he said, oh, okay. What was your dad's name? My, my dad's name was Philip. It, it was Patrick, actually, but um, he had two aunts that had come over to this country earlier before he came over, and um, they said, you have to change your name from Patrick because there aren't any good jobs for Patricks in the United States. So they, they talked him into changing it to Philip. So uh, when my brother was born, it was 12 years younger than I am. They named him Patrick, so they got him back. But my father was in the IRA, so he was in jail in Dublin. And um, when Julie and I went over to uh, Ireland a few years ago, we went through that jail, and it was spooky to know that he had been incarcerated there. And um, the story is that um, the, the British came to, to the house in Dublin, and um, we're going to and, and arrested him. But my aunt, his sister, who was a nurse, took the gun that was up in, in the room and took it over to the hospital and hid it under a patient's mattress because the word was that if they found a gun on the property that they could execute them right away. So he was very young. He was probably 19 when he came to this country, but, but he, he wasn't safe in Ireland, and um, Joseph, who lives in California, just got um, Irish citizenship. He he worked through it. He can get it if it, if your grandfather's there and uh, if your grandfather came from there. So uh, no he, kidding. He's thrilled with that, and and Julie is very annoyed because she worked very hard and <laughs> couldn't get it for some reason. Couldn't find it. So, uh, <laughs> but. Um, you know, that was 1937. I mean, they had just got out of the sanitarium. They, they hadn't been out very long. And, you know, there, was, there were no jobs. And, I mean, you know. Yeah, what did he do? Yeah. What did he end up doing? Dad, dad worked, first of all, he worked at Stop and Shop in Chicago and, and cut hands or something. And then he got a job as a payroll auditor and, um, for um, uh, London Guarantee Building. Okay. which is now a hotel downtown, and it's on Michigan. So last year I took our grandsons to the London Guarantee Building because, and we had a, a window where we could see the river turning green, and they did it right, right in front of our oh, yeah. window. So, so yeah. I said, that was in my bucket list was to, to go back to, because when I was, when Helen and I were kids, 
my father would take us up to one of those windows where he worked and we would see the parades and everything from, yeah. from those windows. So I remember that, you know, and so. What area of Chicago did, did your parents live? Well, evidently when I was born, they must have lived on the west side, but then we lived on the north side for, I mean, until I was married, actually, in okay. Rogers Park. Oh, Rogers yeah, Park, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um, Where'd you go to high school? I was, well, I was a, a dropout. I went to Sullivan High School. But my sister was, well, she was two years older than I was, but she was only a year ahead of me in school. And she decided that she was going to get married when she was 17. Mm -hmm. So she was going to marry a Marine, and my parents were not happy about it. But she said, if, if you don't let me, I'll just go to North Carolina and marry him there because there is no rule there that you have to have permission from your parents. You could get married at 16 there. Mm. So they went along with it and she got married at St. Trump's Church and her marriage lasted about nine years, I think, and then, and then she remarried after that. But, but she was kind of my only friend in high school and and those those were warriors so I got I was able to I probably left school I don't think I was 16 yet but you you could warriors you could get permission to work at the you know national food stores I worked at national food stores okay. for years yeah so on uh, yeah but then uh, and then they opened a store in Skokie and I went out there so eventually I um, I stopped and I worked for Blue Cross for many years downtown on LaSalle Street. So, uh, sure. What, yeah. How did you meet your husband, John? Oh, that, that, that's an interesting story. A friend, my mother worked with a friend and her husband sold coal to the seminary. So he would see John and, and, and his dad. John's father started the seminary before it was built. He started in 1921. Mm -hmm. And, and the seminary was finished in 23, Mundelein Seminary. Mundelein, okay. Yeah, right. And um, He was a construction worker? Huh? What, what he, you said he built it? No, he, he was an engineer. He was an engineer. And, and, he, and he was hired there by Cardinal, by, by Cardinal Mundelein. Okay. So, and some, some nun that was there, the Sister Clayta, who was a, the cook, said, why did you hire a boy for that job? But evidently, he was the only one that knew AC and DC. <laughs> in, in, in those years, and okay. that was important, you know. So he, we found a um, a patent that he had because they owned a six flat in Chicago, and he figured out how to have a thermostat in every built in every apartment so that people weren't paying for all of them. They were they were only paying for their own heat. But John was, of course, in the war. I mean, he, everybody was in those days. He went. He went to um, school in um, up in Winona to um, St. Mary's, and then. Uh, but when he got back, he worked for War Assets for a while, and then just hated it, so he quit. And and he was just hanging around the house. And his father said, "Hey, as long as you're hanging around the house, you can help me over the seminary," which he did and then decided to go for his degree from IIT while he, was, while he was working there. So he worked there for about 50 years. But the man who sold coal would be talking to John's father and John and said, you know, my wife knows this girl in Chicago. So anyway, he called me and we went to some fundraiser for St. Jerome's, the, the parish I lived in. Okay. And then he said he would call me again, and that was the end of it. I mean, I mean, but every every Christmas I would get a card. My mother would call me at work, and by that time I, I worked at Catholic Action. But she'd call me at work and said, "Can I open it? I just want to see if there's someone else's name on it <laughs> <laughs> besides John." So, <laughs> but um, eventually we went up to a. Re class reunion of, of his in um, uh, May of 63. His, his boss, Monsignor Bonish, was a, um, the rector of the seminary, and they were on their way to Rochester to see a, a, a bishop that was quite sick. So they stopped at Winona, and one of John's classmates said, are you coming to the to reunion? John said, oh, I don't think so, because you know I'm not married, and I don't know anybody. And, and Vonish said to him, 
well, why don't you call that girl in Chicago and ask her if, she, if she'll come? Oh, I don't want to do that. But anyway, it, but that is what he did. And, and my poor mother was trying to play it straight and said, well, oh, okay, let me get this straight. You're going to go and pretend you're his wife? I said, no, mother, I'm, I'm just really staying in a room by myself at, <laughs> at the other end of the hall. You know, so, but, um, but that was May of 63, and we were married in October. His father was very ill. He only, he only uh, lived a few months after we were married, and, um, uh, and we were worried that, that he was going to take it. In fact, he, he called me one day at work and said that he didn't even want to wait till October. You know, he, he was just worried about his father. And, and this friend of mine, Monsignor Rosemary, worked for Chancery. I called him and he said, so we'll push it up, you know, so. And then of course, when I told him that, he, he relaxed a little bit, you know, so. Uh, but, Where so, were you married? In Jerome, St. Jerome's. St. Jerome's. And my father was in the hospital because he only had one lung. So um, he was in Evan, no, he was in St. Francis Hospital. <laughs> and I was still in Catholic action. And he called me at work and said that they were going to um, put him in isolation because it looked like the TB had returned. And of course, you know, it was a week before the wedding and I fell apart. And Father Kelly, my boss, said, just call Mayo Clinic tell them to send the x-rays, he'd been up there recently, show them that nothing's changed and so forth. And that's what I did, and they did. So he was only released for the day, and we're walking down the aisle, which is the longest aisle in the archdiocese, and he said to me, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I said, what? He said, oh, I'm only kidding. I mean, <laughs> it, that was the Irish sense of yeah. humor. So, so uh, did he grow up in Dublin? He grew up in Galway, in Uthrarg, right outside of Galway, yeah. But okay. then they moved to Dublin. And, um, and what happened, I think, in the IRA, that so many of the older guys were getting killed, you know. And so, so they were recruiting people. They were like teenagers, you know. They were 15 or 16, and they believed in it. And my other aunt, Aunt Rosalie, who turned out to be a nun, but she would, she was, she was involved too. She was the gopher. I mean, she would bring in stuff. So, but, but in those days, it was it, they were dedicated to it. You know, I mean, somebody said in my other end said in recent years that's not true. They were just, you know, they were like terrorists now. Yeah, you know, they right. they're just doing it for the money and stuff. But. Um, but, but I'm, I'm sure my grandmother never got off her knees after he was incarcerated, you know, because... Uh, How long was he in that prison? I, I don't know exactly. I think a year. But, but on the way, they said that one of the, one of the drivers of the, of the truck that they picked him up in said, you know, why, why do we have to bother with him? Why don't we just kill him? And, uh, and, and the other driver said, no, we're were required to bring him to prison, so I. And what, what year about was that, Francis? I, let's see. Um, he was born in 1906, so 1921, maybe. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so you were you were raised until. Roughly I was age raised. I did, yeah, I thought they were. In fact, many years later, I found out that my sister really resented me when I came, because she didn't know she had a sister. And all of a sudden, she was the only one living in, with them for two years before I came to live with them. So did you call your aunt and uncle? M mother and dad, yes. Mother and dad. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think in fairness, nobody knew whether they were going to live or not yeah. in those days. I mean, I, you know, they, they probably figured, she, my, Helen lived with some friends of theirs. Um, but I think, you know, I think they just, you know, weren't sure, and they would, you know. But you ended up moving back to Chicago with your parents. Yeah, so a, did a you crummy place, Wilson Avenue, an awful place. But I mean, the only thing they could afford, you know, everybody had a shared a community bathroom, you know. It was, wow. So, but some guy, um, they were playing cards or something, and somebody um, made a pass at my sister. 
and that was it. My father said, we're out of here, you know. And w um, Wilson and what? Sheridan. Wilson and Sheridan, okay. Yeah, the, the big sign, Jesus saves or something. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, so, okay. Yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> so, yeah, but, you know, I was, but, but I, when I first came to live with them, I lived like in a room upstairs. And then if I wanted anything, I would knock with my broom because I couldn't be around anybody with a whooping cough because it was, it was contagious. Sure. So my poor father, you know, would be bringing me water and, you know, and, and food and stuff, you know, and uh, so, uh, but it, it was literally years later that my sister told me how much she resented me coming into the picture. You know. Is, in, in your sister became two like years that? older than she, she's she's gone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so was my brother. I mean, yeah, he, he they died of a couple of years apart. Tell me about your siblings. Well, Helen and I for years didn't get along at all. I mean, literally didn't get along. You know. So in fact, I was talking. Somebody that used to work at CLC, and I asked her about her kids, and she said, "Oh, they, it's just awful, you know." So eventually, we c kind of understood each other, but 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 she resented me, but she resented my brother even more because she was 14 when he was born, and he really cut into her social life because my mother wasn't well. I mean, she, you know, she. She thought she was going through the menopause and found out that she was pregnant. You know, my father was delighted with the, with the baby, but even he pitched in and washed all the diapers and everything. And Helen and I were required to come home for school immediately, so that um, we could take care of Pat. And uh, in fact, it, it would, they, once in a while, I get together with my grammar school classmates, so they all talk about going to various houses and having knowing the kids, and I thought, why didn't I do that? And I thought, oh, now I remember, because we, we had to come home right away. So, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but she, she was divorced a couple times. She lived in California. I got out to see her a lot. And um, we played Scrabble, and I invariably won, but she kept all the few times that she won, she kept those <laughs> in the Scrabble box. <laughs> I said, where are the rest of them? I, she said, I only keep the ones where I win. So. <laughs> a little competitive, huh? <laughs> right, but so. But, um, but oh, it, it, in later years, we began to understand each other more, you know. But sure. uh, yeah, yeah, but but I, when we were first married, she would call me and give me all these hints and everything. And John would say, quit calling her <laughs> because, you know, she, she, knew, she knew everything there was. So I said to her one time, please tell me that you're not arguing with me about what day our son was born. And she said, well, I have it written on my calendar. I said, oh, well, <laughs> 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 that must be it. So, uh, but. Um, How about Pat? But Pat, Pat suffered a lot. I mean, he, I, I, I don't, I don't know why exactly, but the last couple of years of his life, he, for some reason, didn't want to have anything to do with me, though I have a, a note from him that he wrote shortly before he died it was really cute, and he, he was telling me how many times I'd saved his life, you know, because <laughs> he thought he was drowning one time, and I was trying to save him and, and, and other things. But um, um, he just, he, I think my, my father loved him, but he resented him because my mother was spending so much attention with him. and, and uh, you know he could he could do no wrong you know okay. so um but um but you know we had some really good years together too we we go to movies and stuff like that and so forth he lived in chicago okay so um yeah but um so he and helen didn't get along very well at all so what grade school did you go to st jerome's st jerome's you went yeah. okay yeah okay and in fact we all did pat did too yeah mm -hmm. And then he went on to Loyola. Okay, so he, right down the block. He eventually right. graduated from Loyola. No, he went on to Loyola College. He went to St. Benedict's um, oh. High School. He Actually, went. he went to St. George. Okay. And then... Over on Ridge. Yeah, and most of the kids from out here went to St. George because they were 
that they were Christian brothers, you know. So. Yeah, my my mother's uncle uh, was the principal of that school. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, back of St. Francis. I mean, it, right. Yeah, right, right, exactly. But for some reason, they were on vacation. I mean, we were all on vacation, I guess, and they didn't get to St. George on the exact day that Pat was supposed to register. And my father tried really hard to get him back in. Uh uh. They uh -huh. would not let him. So but but I was working for Father Kelly at the time and he, he was a good friend of the path at the pastor at St. Benedict, so we got him in there for the last year of his okay. time. So, but um, what was your maiden name? Darcy D apostrophe A R C Y. Okay. And it's it's very Irish. But I think the Normans invaded Ireland, and as a result, that's, you know, I mean, um, and it, you know, spelled a lot of different ways, but. Um, right. But I said probably if we'd had another child, I would have named her or him Darcy, you know, because, um, you know, it would have been, it was fun. So you and John were married in the early 60s? 63. Yeah. And um, there was a lot going on. And huh? There was a lot going on in the 60s. Oh, right. Where were... Well, we were. We went to Ireland for our honeymoon. There's, there's, there's a story that goes with that, that he was going to surprise me in, in, with the, you know, all the plans for the honeymoon. And um, so we were at, I don't know, probably Pizzeria Uno or something downtown. And, um, but he told me about it, and he said, well, we're, we're going from the wedding to Boston first, and we're going to spend the night in Boston and take care of Lingus out the following day. Well, as you probably know, in those days, people didn't live together at all. I mean, so, and, and I kind of looked at him and I said, oh, okay. And he said, what's wrong with that? I said, I don't know if you want to waste a night in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody let me live it down after all that. <laughs> okay, you're wasting a night on your honeymoon. So, uh, but, um, but, but we went to Ireland and then we got back on, um, I think at All Saints Day on November 2nd. And we had rented a house in, in Libertyville. And um, all we had in the house was a cookie jar which I still have, um, and a bottle of scotch. And, and I didn't like scotch, but I was trying to impress John and pretend I liked it. So, <laughs> so anyway, we hadn't, we hadn't, we just got up, we hadn't gone to the store at all, and so we're having scotch and cookies for breakfast, <laughs> and the telephone guy comes in to hook up the telephone, and, and we're both trying to explain to him that we just, got home, we hadn't had time to shop, you know, we don't normally have scotch and cookies for breakfast, and he was, uh, and he was just saying, oh, okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> this what, if, if, that's what, if that's what you want. But I remember John calling me, of course, from the seminary when, um, when Kennedy was uh, assassinated, and I was ironing. You remember exactly what you were doing, and, and we didn't have a television, of course, and um, I just, I, I turned on the radio, and then we bought a small black and white television for the, for the funeral, you know, like, it was still put in our little, in our little, it was one of those ranch houses on, on those flat houses on Rockland Road. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, so, um, um, Is that where you raised your family then? No, no, yeah. then we moved, we moved to Mundelein when um, Julie was two. We moved to Monterey. We wanted to be closer to his mother and to um, to the seminary. Okay. In fact, I said to somebody recently that um, he was on 24-hour call for, because now he was the engineer of the seminary. So I said I used to say to him, "I'm going to the, get the seminary to call you and tell you that your babies are crying <laughs> because <laughs> he would get up and be out of the house, all dressed and go over there, but the kids could cry all night. And he wouldn't hear them, you know." <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, uh, yeah. So did he, he retire from the archdiocese? Is that how that? Yeah, he was there almost, he was there almost 50 years. Wow. At the, at the seminary. So, um, yeah, he is, um, 
and and like a lot of places, it changed over the years, you know. And I said to him, you know, you have to remember the good times that that you had. You know, there were a lot of fun times and good times that the guys all had together. They had a they had a real family, um, you know. In fact, one of his good friends. Um, is still alive, and um, I, I see them quite often. He, he'll be he'll be ninety next year. The the, the guy that he, actually his father sponsored uh, him from Ireland, and I don't think I don't think you. Well, he certainly didn't go to high school. I'm not even sure he finished grammar school, but many many times John would say to him, um, "What do you what do you think? What do you think we should do here?" You know, and, and he said because even though he had the engineering book and, and the degree, Mac could, Hugh could see the pic, the broad picture and say, you know, I think, I think we should do this and this, and John would go with it. He'd say, sure, that's what we should do. Yeah, but, but you get so narrowed into, into the way to do it from books and so forth. That, well, he yeah. had the practical application. Yeah, yeah. And, right. and, but Mac, could, he could see the whole picture. So, um, yeah, in fact, um, when John died, um, he, was in, he was in the other bedroom. And um, when I went in to wake him, I had, a, I had a doctor's appointment and went in to wake him. He was gone. And uh, when I called Hugh to tell him, he said, and he's from the north of Ireland, and, but he and got family over there. But he said it was more like losing a brother than his own than his own brothers, you know, because he was they were so close to each other over the years, you know. So, on. and then Monsignor Vonish, who was his boss, became the bishop of of Joliet. So we would get together with him quite often. So, in fact, shortly after we were married, John. And, John had such a bad back, he, he literally couldn't stand up straight. And um, so we were going to go up to Mayo Clinic with Monsignor Vonish, and we were borrowing his car from the Cardinal's house, because he lived at the Cardinal's house. So one of the nuns ran out, Sister Josetta, and she said, Franny, I just want you to know that Johnny had that bad back before he got married. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't my fault, <laughs> but but I drove all the way because John couldn't drive, and it was interesting. What they told him was, he used to be working all over the seminary and all kinds of things, but now he took over his dad's job and he was sitting at a desk, hmm. and it, you know it wasn't just his back; it was his stomach muscles and everything. He just he wasn't he, was, <laughs> he wasn't used to doing that so um yeah yeah well tell me a little bit about the characteristics of john if he were uh, well just tell me a little bit about your husband oh well he was he was a very sweet gentle guy you know and we were we went to ireland many times he he i mean he didn't have any relatives over there but i still had aunts and uncles and everybody so but um a few years after we were married we we realized he was an alcoholic, and um, I didn't pick up on it. My kids said that's because I was drinking at the same time. So, in, in seriously, in those days, even when I worked at Blue Cross, people were still drinking a lot. You know sure. what I mean? In fact, I said one of the dumbest things anybody ever said was, "Have one for the road." You know, sometimes I have my cookie jar and I say, have one for the road, and I think, and we did, which, we, you know, is, we're just lucky that we're alive. Yeah. But anyway, he, he got sick, and this good friend of ours who was a cardiologist admitted him to Condell, and then I said, you know, he can't go, come home, he has to go to rehab. And um, so I, he's, John said, no, because I'll lose my job. And I called this really good friend of mine, Monsignor Rosemeyer, and I said, John's worried that he'll lose his job. He said, I don't think so. He said, call Father Schrader, who was his boss, and find out if that's true. And he said, never mind, I'll call him, and I'll call you right back. So he called him, and of course, they knew. They, they already knew that he was that, and so they were delighted that he was going in for rehab. 
and he he went there. I think he was there a month, you know, and we we lived there. But then when I took uh, alcoholic counseling at at Northeastern, we went to Lutheran General for. Um, these people would do it on an outpatient basis every day, and it made so much more sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, the month everybody's secluded and they're doing their own thing and they're, you know, and they're reading the books and, and so forth and everything, but they're still secluded. And the people that were coming on a daily basis would say, you know, I had this client come in today and he'd say, oh, you can have one drink, one, one martini, and he'd say, you know, what, what can I say to him? And somebody else in the group would respond and say, this is what, this is what I did, this is what happened to me. So they were, they were facing these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis and, and I thought, boy, that makes a lot more sense to me than having them hold up someplace yeah. for a month, you know, so right. on. But then that was, that was 1976. And, and I, he had one slip up, and then I, I called his sponsors. My, they were mean. <laughs> they were, yeah. Well, okay, if you want to live your life like that, blah blah blah. You know, so it's, but they knew what they were doing. Anyway, uh, in, we went to Ireland that year, and somebody said, "Hey, if he can stay sober in Ireland, he can stay. So <laughs> <laughs> he can stay sober anywhere." And he was from that time on. So he. That's great. And and and, and he made drinks for everybody. He was, I mean, made. Uh, he was comfortable know, in his sobriety. Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was fine. Yeah, uh, he he went to some meetings, but he didn't really need them. But um, but smoked a lot more then. And then Laura, our youngest, got him to stop smoking. You know. So, um, but um, what would he? How would he describe you? You think? Huh. Maybe. Um, unpredictable. You know, I didn't like to be predictable, so, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, you know, we had a good life. Though it, it, I still write to him every day, it's, it's, and it's been this is seventeen years. So the the kids will throw the journals all away, I'm sure. But um, and and I carry his picture with me wherever I go. So um, this the, the my son's. Um, wife now, but she was his significant other when I went to visit them one time and I and I had his picture up in, in, in my room and Brianna, my granddaughter, who is Joe's daughter, I, I don't know, and she was saying, she said, so does the whole world have a picture? picture of Papa Bud, you know, because she figured that, that everybody, and I said, no, I really carry it with me. But, but I, 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 the only thing, and, and I bet other people have these regrets, that when he, he gets Parkinson's and I thought, um, it, I just wasn't what I wanted to be. You know, I wasn't as understanding or as, you know, I mean, uh, it, it, and, and so, you know, I, I still apologize for that sometimes, you know, so. so. But you write him every day. Uh -huh. Every every morning. Every morning. Yeah. So it's a kind of a routine that you have. Uh huh. Yeah. Just some stuff that you know. Not, you know, nothing big. You yeah. know, but but some funny stuff and 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 then and then because you know because I believe in heaven and I believe that um, my siblings are are there. You know, I I'll say to them something. Tell Helen that you know I want to scrabble or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Or or, uh, or, I, or tell tell Helen and my mother that they would would have loved the Carol Burnett show, you know. So they were <laughs> they were both fans of her. You know, did you but. see the special Sunday? Yeah, I, I did. Wasn't that wonderful? It was. It yeah. really was. What an ensemble! It's very annoying that she had those good looking legs at eighty four, but yeah. That, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, yeah, they did a good job. I said, and imagine that they managed to have a show for two hours without using the F word once. Yeah, you know, it right. was just really. I mean, you really can do that, you know. So yeah. it was just straight away funny. That's yeah, it so was. You're through and through Catholic. I can tell that. Um, I am. I I usually I usually go to mass every day. I didn't make it today. For I was didn't feel that well. But what but, what 
parish do you Well, I, I go to St. Joe's on Sundays, you know, and then we go out for breakfast usually, always. Oh, okay. But however, we go to 715, which is, you know, I said, I don't know how we, <laughs> we keep doing it. Doesn't anybody want to go to a later mass? <laughs> but um, but St. Mary of the Annunciation, or what we used to call St. Mary of Fremont, is, sure. is my church. And okay. so that's where I go usually. And I go to Santa Maria too. You know, so I go there on Tuesdays, and then I bring communion to um, somebody in Buffalo Grove on Tuesdays because um, she's in a um, sunrise nursing home. Okay. I was saying to somebody at breakfast yesterday, though, I, I've never met anyone more content to be in a nursing home, which is really, really nice. I mean, she's yeah. she's the a wife of the deacon, uh, the, the, the guy who used to be a deacon at our church, and uh, she's just very happy there. So it, it's wonderful. wonderful, you know. Yeah, it's nice and that you bring your community. Yeah, it's great. Yeah.